depending on where you are. I'm Dan Wood here for the Mariners Museum. And today our topic is going to be all about Mary Rose. Mary Rose was one of the very first, what we would think of today as capital ships of the English Navy, uh, and which is very significant, but she's remembered more for her tragic loss than for her actual accomplishments during her lifetime which was considerable for a wooden ship in those days. She was in the King's service for about 40 years. Um, but she's really most known today for what came in modern times when the wreck was located, explored, excavated, and eventually raised and turned into what's an incredible museum in Portsmouth, England. So let's get started with the story of the Mary Rose. The story begins in the Middle Ages in England, which at that time was pretty much a backwater place led by a bunch of people that were constantly fighting with one another and taking the throne from one another. Uh, as a naval power, she was third rate at best, not like any of the great naval powers of the world like Venice. Uh, but in any case, long, long ago on that island far, far away, there lived a bunch of kings with unimaginative names and funny hats. Here we have Henry I through Henry VI. Now, I planted the earworm of the song there. Everyone was an Henry. They wouldn't have a Willie or a Sam. Uh, the fact is, they did have a couple of Willies, William the Conqueror and his son, William II, who were actually, William the Conqueror was the father of Henry I. And there were some other kings and queens interspersed among these guys. But the point is, we went through a bunch of Henrys. And then, Along came Henry VII, and he really brought England out of the Dark Ages. Uh, he seized power from uh, Richard in the War of the Roses, and uh, there were actually, he and Richard took turns on the throne back and forth, <clears throat> beating each other in battle. But eventually, Henry VII seized the throne permanently. He married Elizabeth of York, who was the daughter of Richard's brother, Edward III, or Edward the IV. And as we see down here on the bottom, the symbol of his family, the Lancaster House of Lancaster, was a red rose. And his wife's family, okay, I'm having trouble with my cursor, here we go. Uh, the House of York was a white rose. And once he married Elizabeth, the symbol for the new family, the Tudor family, was the white rose superimposed on the red rose. So moving on. His foreign policy was fairly simple. Let's keep peace and create economic prosperity. Pretty good policy even for these days. Uh, there was really no Navy before Henry VII. He created a small group of five royal warships to basically to protect that foreign trade. He also subsidized the merchant fleet uh, to serve as a naval reserve in time of need. The ships that he built for the Navy specifically, on the bottom left you see a carrack, this was a type of seagoing vessel, basically pioneered by the Portuguese, pretty much the precursor to the Spanish galleon. And then on the lower right, you see a gallius. A gallius was a direct descendant of the uh, biremes and triremes of the Greeks and the Romans and the Phoenicians. It was kind of a throwback to old times. But that was his navy. And then along came his son, Henry VIII, who became king in 1509. He married his older brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, from Spain, uh, cementing an alliance with England and Spain, basically against France. Uh, he did have a son named Henry. Uh, he only lived about two months. And he had another illegitimate son named Henry, but he was not heir to the throne, so there was to be no Henry IX. But just as a note, three of his children did, in fact, rule England uh, for a little over close to 60 years actually after his death as Edward IV, Mary I, and the great Queen Elizabeth I. Well, over the next four decades, as you see, he did a bunch of things. He made major steps to build a real navy. He established several royal dockyards, which are basically navy bases. He encouraged all of his nobles to be military professionals, either army officers or naval officers. He established a naval board, 
which was basically um, the Department of the Navy, a bureaucracy to manage the Navy, uh, manage procurement and maintenance of vessels, supplies, recruiting and training. And he also initially hired a whole bunch of foreign mercenaries to be the core for his new standing Navy. And the idea was that these foreigners would be able to train the English in the latest uh, techniques of the art of war and thus uh, provide the core for the future of the British or English Navy. Uh, the last thing is he started a domestic cannon foundry industry. Before this, all cannons and pretty much all small arms, anything that shot, including in fact long bows, was procured from foreign nations. So he uh, made major steps toward being self-sufficient. For all this, he's known as the father of the English Navy. He inherited five small ships from his father. During his reign, he built, purchased, or captured about 95 warships. And by the end of his reign, the Navy was close to 60 ships. And it all began, the very first ship was Mary Rose de la Tour. As you see, that's French for of the tower. This was the designation that was given to Royal Navy ships prior to the advent of HMS, his or Her Majesty's ship, which we have in use today. Mary Rose was one of the first two ships that Henry VIII ordered. Uh, he ordered Herricks, Mary Rose, and the Peter Pomegranate. A lot of people through the years have thought that Mary Rose was named after his very attractive younger sister. Uh, that's an interesting story, but probably not true. It's probably the Virgin Mary and the Peter would be uh, St. Peter, but the rose in Mary Rose definitely was the rose of the Tudor house and the pomegranate uh, was his wife's family symbol. All right, so let's talk about these characters. The carracks that were in merchant service had generally three masts. The two forward masts would have square uh, sails for maximum wind, and the one after mast had triangular sails, lateen rig, to allow a little better maneuverability. The ones that were built for naval service, which were called great ships, basically what we today would call a capital ship, generally had four masts, two forward ones, square rig, the after two, lateen rig. In this picture, we can see in the front, let me see if I can get my cursor to work here for a second. There we go. Nope, there you go. In the front, this awkward looking structure was called the fore castle. Today, we still have the term, it's the forecastle for the pointy end of the ship. And okay, my cursor doesn't like it. On the back of the ship, in the stern, we have the after castle. In between, on the main deck, you can see. There is netting here and netting up here. This was anti-boarding net, so that when they came close alongside another ship, the crew of those would have trouble getting onto the deck of the English ship. Up on the top of the mast, we see these structures. You might think of them as crow's nests. They were actually called fighting tops. They were fairly large. They could hold six or eight soldiers and a couple of small cannons, uh, and it allowed them to fire down onto the decks of enemy ships. And of course, all the banners you see, uh, the white square with the red cross, that was the uh, cross of St. George, which was the flag of England at the time, and the green and white streamer portion, those are the colors of the House of Tudor. This is pretty much what a carrot looked like, a naval carrot. And I'll point out one more thing, right here up on the bow, that little round object, that was basically a figurehead with a carving of the Tudor rose on it. So here we have, the idea of what a character looks like. Mary Rose quickly got a reputation as a pretty good ship. In 1513, a race was arranged with nine other ships that were thought to be fast, and the Admiral of the British or English fleet said, Mary Rose is the noblest ship of sail of any great ship at this hour that I trow know to be in Christendom. Uh, sort of interesting that he put that qualification of in Christendom on there. I'm not sure if I have the next slide in here or not, but uh, you may be aware that right about this time, the Chinese were reaching the peak of their sea power and uh, they were building ships that were far bigger than anything in Europe. But the two sides had not quite yet met into each other at this time, so they had no idea what existed outside of this. There you go. Admiral Zhang He's uh, 
uh, fleet of 300 rather large ships shown for comparison next to Columbus's Santa Maria. Uh, so, but he didn't know about those, and as far as he was concerned, in Europe, Mary Rose was the finest ship. Now, a couple of years later, Henry did build a bigger ship, Henry Grassadier, Henry, thanks be to God or by the grace of God. This is generally known as the Great Harry. Sounds a little irreverent, but that's all right. Uh, it was significantly bigger than Mary Rose, but it proved to be kind of sluggish and top heavy, so it really wasn't a very good warship. But it was great for showing the colors uh, and serving as a vehicle for royal visits. Uh, but Mary Rose remained the best fighting ship in the Navy. During Mary Rose's life, uh, shortly after she was launched, the British or the English, I keep saying British, I apologize, they weren't Britain yet. Um, the English engaged in Henry's, not really the first French war, but Henry's first French war, uh, and served as Admiral Howard's flagship, carried nearly a thousand soldiers to France. That has to have been packed like sardines. Second French War, a decade later, again carried troops to France. When that war was over, she was laid up in reserve in Portsmouth, England, in the Royal Shipyard, Royal Dockyard. In the middle of that period, repairs were done to the hull to uh, take care of any problems with leaking. And toward the end of that period, uh, around 1534, Henry managed to get himself excommunicated from the Catholic Church for annoying marriage to one of his wives, uh, and that's when he founded the Church of England and declared himself the head. But at that time, all of a sudden, by alienating himself from the Catholic Church, basically they alienated themselves in England from all possible foreign allies in Europe, uh, all those nations being Catholic. Uh, so the, this ship was underwent a major rebuilding. The castles were expanded, made even bigger. The lower decks were reinforced to hold very heavy guns, which were now using gun ports. This is a new invention, the idea that you could have an opening in the hull that could be opened to shoot through and then closed and sealed uh, as protection against the weather when you were sailing. Uh, before that, all the large guns had to be on the open weather deck of the ship. But he put them lower down in the ship, that made the ship more stable, allowed them to carry more weight, and the ship was impressively armed. After that last refit, he carried 14 heavy bronze guns, 12 iron port pieces. These were very large, long range guns. 65 other guns, most of those, as we'll see, were small, almost handheld cannons. Uh, she carried over 1,200 cannonballs, 250 longbows, uh, which would have equated to that many soldiers, and over 4,000 arrows. 300 pikes, those are basically spears to defend the ship against borders, bills. Those are pikes with an ax added to the end, uh, pretty nasty. And 50 assorted handguns. There were some pistols, there were some matchlock, shoulder fire guns. Um, but those were not really at their prime of effectiveness yet. And lots and lots of swords and knives. Pretty much everybody in the crew had a knife. The officers all had swords. The crew of the Mary Rose at that time was made up of 185 sailors whose job it was to sail the ship. 200 soldiers, who were the offensive power, 20 to 30 gunners who manned those uh, large guns on the lower deck, 50 officers and specialists. The officers included not only the captain of the ship and his subordinates, but also the embarked admiral, because this was generally a flagship, and his staff. The specialists were people like the ship's carpenter, the surgeon, the bosun, uh, let's see, the cook, various other people who were distinguished from the crew at large. The total crew then was about 450 men, but when she went into battle, she could carry as many as 200 or more extra soldiers. And there was also a group of people that tended to always be around called gentlemen, who were basically just that. They were extraneous people uh, of high status who came along trying to gain experience so that they could comply with Henry's uh, suggestion or mandate that all of his officers become, all of his nobles become military. Well, let's get to the death of the Mary Rose. In 1545, Henry found that the French were getting ready to invade England, uh, and so he gathered his entire fleet, about 50 ships at the time, under the protective cover of the forts in Portsmouth Harbor, 
In this picture, you can see a large port in the center and one battery is along both shores of the harbor. And he had about 80 ships all together with about 30 merchant ships added to his fleet, about 12,000 soldiers. And along came a French fleet of 200 plus ships, 30,000 soldiers. In other words, two and a half times as many men, two and a half times as many ships. Pretty scary thing. And on July 18th and 19th occurred the Battle of the Soldiers. Of course, I know what your next question is, because it was certainly my first question. What's a Solon? Uh, and here we see on the left, we see England across from France, and where the little blue arrow on the bottom is, that is pointing to the Isle of Wight, uh, which is just off the coast of England. And on the right, we see a close up of that. We see England on the top, we see Isle of Wight on the bottom, and the strait between them was known as the Solon. And interestingly, at the mouth of the Solent, that area labeled Spithead, uh, that was an area where Henry VIII and virtually every monarch since has held annual naval review. All right, so we know what a Solent is. On July 18th, the French entered the Solent and the English engaged them sort of half-heartedly at long range, not much happened. Uh, they withdrew to the harbor at night. The next morning, uh, the French came in. There was no wind, so the French attacked with their oared vessels, their galleys and galleasses, and it was beginning to look pretty grim, but then around noon, a light breeze came up, and Mary Rose and the other Carracks were able to get up sail and move into battle. And Mary Rose led the English Carracks into the battle, but before she could even bring her guns to bear on the French, we had a small problem. All of a sudden, Mary Rose heeled over to starboard, uh, water poured in through her open gun ports, ports which were low to the water line, and she sank like a rock. And we don't really know how long, but the impression is pretty much like a rock. And as Henry got to look on from shore, the ship went down. Out of the maybe 600 people on board, there were about 34 survivors. What happened to all the rest? Well, the ones below deck were probably crushed or had their exits blocked by things like cannons rolling across the deck. Uh, there's nothing worse than a loose cannon. We've always heard that. Uh, and the ones that were able to get to the main deck were blocked by those anti-boarding nets that were designed to keep anybody from coming on board. They also effectively kept anybody from leaving. So practically everybody on board went down with the ship. Now, just as, uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, what happened? Well, the ship was making a sharp turn, which would have naturally caused it to heel open, uh, heel over. The gun ports were tied open for going into battle. The French claimed that they sank the ship with their gunfire. When archaeologists got into the ship, what they found was there was no sign of any damage from French fire. There was, in fact, one cannonball found on board the ship, neatly stowed in uh, one of the ammunition locks. So that's probably not true. Uh, could there have been a sudden gust? Could well have happened that the ship was sort of under control, but pushing the limit and a sudden gust would have caused it to reel over a little more. Uh, was it overloaded, perhaps? Um, remember that when it was rebuilt, they extended the height of both castles and it had a full complement of soldiers and weapons. Uh, inexperience and incompetence over the next several decades, there was a very active game of blame shifting with everybody trying to blame somebody else captain was new to the ship. Uh, we'll never know, but basically the ship heeled over too far, water poured into the gun port, and down she went. Uh, just as a side point, the British did win the Battle of the Solent. Uh, they went on to defeat the French. They had a much better knowledge of the local waters, where the shoals were, the effects of the local tides, which were very extreme. And the French ships, their largest ships, uh, had in fact suffered some serious damage on the way over from France. Uh, whatever the reasons, the French decided to withdraw, and that was the end of that. Well, within a few weeks after the ship's sinking, um, there were thoughts given to salvaging the ship. There were some Venetians, remember from that great world sea power, who had an office in Portsmouth, who were experts in salvage. They were quite used to uh, recovering small merchant vessels. This was something entirely different. This was bigger, but they thought they could apply their method. Their methods basically involved attaching ropes to the mast and pulling the ship upright, and then putting ropes underneath the ship. They would have a large ship on either side of the shipwreck underwater, and those large ships would 
fill themselves partly with water to sink down. They would run ropes underneath the ship to be salvaged from one of the ships on the surface to the other. When those ropes were taut, they would then pump the water out of their ship, which would lift them up and lift the ship off the bottom. It was a good theory. It worked in practice on most ships, but not on the Mary Rose. We ended up breaking the main mast off while trying to right the ship. Even in only a few weeks on the bottom, the ship had uh, substantially been filled up with sand from the shifting bottoms in the area. Uh, so in the end, their best efforts, basically all they could do was recover the sails and some of the rigging, and that was that. Mary Rose was left to be forgotten. Well, about 300 years later, along came a couple of brothers the Dean brothers in Portsmouth. One of them had patented a fireman's helmet. It had looked suspiciously like a diving helmet. You see it on the right. It had a long hose on it that would feed air to the fireman as he went into a burning building. Unfortunately, after they got the patent, uh, I think it got discovered fairly quickly that the hose was somewhat subject to the effects of fire. And this did not help firemen at all. Uh, but they quickly found that it was, in fact, a very effective tool for diving and salvage. The Deans recovered several cannons and other artifacts. A couple of their cannons ended up in the uh, Tower of London with the, the, the Royal Arsenal. Uh, the items that they brought up, for the most part, were sold. And when the effort stopped being profitable, they stopped their excavation. The way they were excavating was basically they would use explosive charges to clear a bunch of sand and a bunch of wreckage, and then they would go in and find what they could find, and then they would explode another charge. And when they finished, basically they reported that the wreck had been destroyed. But in fact, it hadn't. At least half of the ship was still there. Well, round three of salvage is the modern rediscovery. In 1965, a bunch of scuba divers in southern England uh, formed. Uh, the Project Solent ship, whose goal it was to identify uh, the location of all of the significant warships that had been sunk over history in the Solent. Using archival research, they found old maps, hydrographic surveys, uh, other information about where different ships had sunk and used that to narrow their search area. In 1967, you see Margaret Rule. She was a very famous British archaeologist who specialty was ancient Greece and Rome. She knew nothing about underwater archaeology, but then basically nobody else did. She very quickly learned to dive, and she came up with procedures to be used in underwater marine archaeology, which basically pioneered the field for the rest of the world. Uh, and in fact, the processes that they used on the wreck underwater uh, were very similar to what was done on the surface, very careful marking of where everything came from, very meticulous uh, excavation so that nothing would be missed. And as we'll see, uh, this resulted in a, a trove of incredible artifacts. Well, in 1968, the record, uh, the source to the location of the wreck was finally pinpointed. And uh, in 1970, having discovered the site, uh, with a little bit of looking, they found a gun very similar to the uh, cannons that the Dean brothers had recovered from the wreck 150 years earlier. In 1971, a winter storm kind of scoured the bottom and it exposed a bunch of timbers at the site of the Mary Rose. And from there, in subsequent years, excavation work began actively to clear the wreck and determine its extent. You can see it. Uh, progressing from year to year uh, until by 2004, actually by about 1979, you could see a good clear outline of the ship. And in 1975, a well-known amateur diver came along and joined the team. The effect of this was electrifying. Basically, he opened the doors to getting permits necessary to protect the wreck. Uh, he was in a position to influence legislation. Uh, involving the uh, recovery and preservation of the wreck. And more than anything else, probably uh, he focused public attention on the effort and helped raise interest in the activity and support in terms of financial support and public interest. 1978, Mary Rose Trust was established to determine what to do to protect the wreck. 
And it didn't take them long to figure out that the only thing that would protect it would be to get it out of the water. The entire wreck was excavated uh, using Margaret Rule's meticulous, detailed, and slow method by hand. This is not my graphic, but it's pretty good. It gives you an idea of the size of the ship and the uh, degree of the effort that it must have taken to get all that sand out of the ship. 10 11, October 11th, 1981, the remains were finally brought to the surface. That doesn't look like much there in the yellow cradle, but that is a massive, massive crane. And uh, that's a pretty big chunk of ship. But in fact, they had probably removed about half of it, anything that could easily be detached before they lifted it. So that is, in fact, less than there was and less than there is. Well, they brought this wreck into dry dock number three in Portsmouth and built a roof over it. And they proceeded with the long effort of cleaning it and putting it back together. Years of treatment, you see a bunch of hoses and pipes here, basically for a period of a number of years, it was 24 hours a day being sprayed with a solution of polyethylene glycol, uh, which kept it from drying out and shriveling. Uh, and in the long run, the polyethylene glycol basically replaces the water and the fibers and helps bulk up the wood and strengthen it. It's a uh, common way of preserving wooden artifacts, but it had never been done on this scale before. And of course, the other artifacts from the bottom took time to clean. This is a, who knows what this is, it's a marine concretion that formed around a bunch of stuff. And all of this had to be in detail, cleaned and prepared for display. Finally, in 2012, the Mary Rose Museum opened in Portsmouth at the historic Portsmouth shipyard. And uh, it's a fascinating structure. It's kind of modern, it looks sort of ship-like, but this is built literally over the dry dock number three, uh, the permanent enclosure for the ship. And the inside of the museum is absolutely incredible. There's a series of four levels of observation galleries. The bottom three are glass enclosed, one for each level of the ship. The bottom one is at the very bottom of the ship, and one for each of the next three levels of the ship, uh, so that you can stand level with that level of the ship, examine the rest. The top of the four, you go through an airlock, and it's actually an open air gallery where you have a clear view of the ship without having to take pictures through glass. And all this time while you're in these galleries looking at the ship, behind you, oh, well, okay, let's give you real quick the ship. Uh, this is a closer view of the hull of the ship. You can see running down on the bottom uh, left, kind of, you can see the keel of the ship and a little bit of uh, the side of the ship coming toward us, but basically it's half the ship. But you can go from bow, stern, and see everything in between. It's impressive, I will tell you that. Meanwhile, behind you, there's a series of display galleries that show what you would see uh, if you were on that level in the ship. On the bottom of the right, you see a brick oven. This was one of two brick ovens that were down in the bottom of the ship in the galley where the cook prepared meals. We'll talk a little bit more about that. On the upper left, we see a gun emplacement, a gun port. This is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like uh, from inside the ship. And the artifacts are all the real things that were recovered from the wreck. In between, as you go up from one gallery to the next, uh, there are interpretive galleries with displays of the things that were recovered from the ship what we can learn from. Now, this is one showing the shipwright's tools, the carpenter, uh, everything in there. If you happen to be a woodworker, you see a couple of adzes, it's a sideways axe for uh, shaping wood, a number of carpenter's planes, uh, you see a scribe for measuring, mallet, uh, the T-shaped thing in the right center, is a caulking mallet, uh, and below that you see a black blob that was basically pitch, tar, uh, and there's a piece of rope there. They would saturate the rope with the tar, and they would pound that into cracks in the ship's hull as, as waterproof. So again, all these things give us a real insight to what people were doing on the ship. Well, let's talk about the guns that were found on the ship. Upper left, that's the first gun that was recovered in 1970. 
which matched the guns that had previously been discovered by the Beans brothers, which made it pretty sure that this was indeed Mary Rose. That gun happens to be a Lombard. It's a long iron barrel with reinforcement bands around it. And it had a breech which detached. You could load the powder and the cannonball into the breech, attach it to the end of the gun, screw it on, and fire it. And if you had two or three of these, you could fire the gun in fairly rapid succession. That was a technique of loading that was very good, but as guns got more powerful, the technology to make the breach did not, went out of fashion until about the time of the Civil War when we were able to bring that idea back. The other guns you see are large bronze guns. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. But these are the guns that would have been below the main deck shooting out of the gun. On the upper decks, that thing on the top looks like a giant toothpick. Uh, the yellow part on the left is actually the remains of a wooden handle. The muzzle of this gun is on the extreme right. And the fin that hangs down, basically a couple of sailors would manhandle this. They would hook it over the rail of the ship with that fin on the outside, and they would light a match to it. It would shoot, and the fin would keep the recoil from coming back on the sailor. These guns were anti-personnel guns. They weren't designed to make holes in ships. They were designed to wreak havoc. They were basically super shotguns. They would be loaded with lots and lots of pellets and being shot down onto the deck of an enemy ship were doubtless very effective. The one on the bottom is a smaller version of that breech-loading Lombard. You see the breech block lifted up. And again, they could fire this fairly rapidly if they had more than one block. And you see in the center of it a swivel attachment this would basically be attached to the rail of the ship at various points and used, again, for anti-personnel purposes. Look a little bit at some of these guns. Upper left, we see the casting from one of the guns. We see the Tudor rose with a crown above it. And around it on the ribbon is inscribed the British royal motto, which is actually the French. Why not? It says, Oni soit qui mal y pon. Basically, evil unto him who thinks evil. On the right, we see another one. You see what looks like kind of a horsey dragon and a horsey horse. These are the precursors of the lion and the unicorn of the royal crest today. Under that, you see H, Roman numeral HR, Henry VIII Breck. And the lion on the bottom left is a casting on the side of one of these guns. Ropes would go through its mouth just as to restrain the gun's recoil move them back into battery after they've been loaded. This is an engraving from one of these. It's in Latin. It says, Henry VIII, by the grace of God, King of England and France, that was a little wishful thinking, defender of the faith, Lord of Ireland, and on earth the supreme head of the English church. The man was not proud at all. Some of the gunner's tools. On the upper left, you see a series of lined up objects, on the left a cannonball, then the wooden head of the ramrod that was used to push the powder and the cannonball into the barrel, and on the right side of that photo in each row you have two scoops. These were used to measure and insert the gunpowder into the barrel of the gun. Below that, a bunch of things that look like they're kind of carved with a fantastic animal head uh, for the most part. The one next to the bottom is actually in the shape of a human hand. These are called limb stocks. Basically, in the mouth of each of these would be inserted a long, slow-burning fuse, kind of like a candle wick, and that would be used to bring fire to the tent. Thus, ready, aim, fire. Uh, and on the upper right uh, is a priming wire. In order to light the cannon, you had to bring the match to a hole that allowed the fire into the barrel where the gunpowder was. And this was used after each shot to clean out any gunpowder residue to make sure the guns fire accurately. And on the bottom right, a couple of things from the master gunner's chest. Uh, the thing with the round object and around it, that's a shot gauge. There wasn't any standardization to speak of. Practically every gun was whatever size it was and required cannonballs to fit. And so the shot gauges allowed the master gunner to make sure that the right cannonballs were going to the right gun. Uh, below that, is the remains, uh, not very good shape, of a book. It was probably a journal that the master gunner kept. It had information about determining range and so forth. But again, we have a wealth of, of incredible artifacts detailing the 
process of maintaining the shading is done. Well, on a small arm scale, on the left top, you see a chest. There were several of these chests that were closed wooden chests that contained in each one about 50 longbows. These are made of yew wood, and the tips have horn uh, tips with notches on them for the bowstring. These were about as long as the man who fired them, sometimes longer. They took a great deal of strength to shoot, but as a result, they also shot with great power. On the bottom right, you see two bundles. The top is a bundle of arrows as recovered from the wreck. The iron tips are pretty well corroded off, and the feathers are gone. On the bottom, you see a reconstruction of what that would look like. Upper right, if you've ever gone to camp and shot at the archery range, you probably use one of these. It's a leather arm guard for the archers their arm against the snap of the bowstring. Personal weapon, uh, upper left. Pretty much everybody on board had a knife. That was standard at the time, like a cell phone is to us today, I guess. On the right and bottom, officers' swords. And in the uh, middle left is a picture of one of the displays. On the top of that, you see a couple of corroded wooden objects. Those are the stocks of matchlock guns, shoulder fire. Below that, an array of daggers, uh, and officers' swords, various other things. And that interesting arrow in the center, uh, that is actually what was called wildfire. Just behind the point of that, they would tie a bundle of highly flammable material mixed with gunpowder. And before they shot this, they would light a fuse, uh, which would set the exterior of that on fire. And when it hit the enemy ship, that would break apart, scatter flaming materials all over the ship, which would then spread like wildfire. The fighting top, that kind of crow's nest on the top of the mast. The masts were long gone, but this happens to be a fair spire, fighting top that was found stored in the hole, deep down in the hold of the ship. A little hard to see the scale there, but it's about six or eight feet across and would hold quite a few soldiers. Other items, uh, the rigging. Again, the mast and the rigging were gone, but there was lots of spare things stored down below. You see on the right blocks and tackles that were used to tighten lines, to raise the sails, to do everything they needed to do. A whole bunch more different blocks on the bottom right. Uh, on the top left, that's a fascinating piece of equipment called a peril block. It's basically a bunch of ball bearings put together in a bundle wrapped around the mast. And you would attach a spar or a cross tree to this, and using the block and tackle, you would slide it up the mast, enabling, enabling you to raise and lower uh, the sails very quickly. On the bottom, we see a couple of visitors at the museum with a big hunk of the mooring line, the rope that was used to tie up the ship. We look at this kind of thing, we say we can't imagine letting people touch an artifact of that pricelessness. But in fact, there were hundreds of feet of this stuff recovered and they had enough bits and pieces that they're able to actually use it for, for hands-on experience for the visitors. And that's really kind of just to put your hands on a piece of ship that's almost 500 years old. We have to navigate the ship. Uh, there's a variety of navigational equipment, a couple of dividers on the upper left that would have been used to measure distances on the chart. On the upper right, an astrolabe, kind of a precursor of the sextant that was used to observe the stars and from that calculate position, primarily latitude, how far north and south we were. And on the bottom, there are two gimbaled compasses, the first of their kind known from the Western world. Uh, gimbaled compasses basically have a swivel on it that allows it to swivel from side to side, and then a second swivel that allows what's inside that first swivel to swivel from front to back. And in essence, basically, no matter what the ship is doing, pitching, feeling, uh, the compass always stays level and gives an accurate picture. Lighting. Well, there's a lot of interior of that ship that's going to be dark if the gun ports aren't open. So we have a number of candles. On the left, you see a candlestick. It can be placed flat on the table and used as such. You can pick it up and carry it. Or you can insert that uh, part that sticks out to the right into a hole in the bulkhead made for the purpose and have it be a wall picture. On the right is a lantern. Originally, it would have had 
horn or glass, something transparent enclosure uh, to make it safer to carry in the interior of the ship. Communication. Well, we have to communicate. Um, on the left is the Mary Rose's bell. This is probably about two feet high and 18 inches wide. It's a pretty handy bell. Ships then and to the present day, more symbolic today, but uh, have always carried bells. Bells are the primary means of signaling the crew. Uh, most importantly, they're used to tell time. If you've ever been on a ship, you know that uh, we have a series of bells uh, starting at noon with 12 bells, and then we start over at 12.30 with one bell, two bells at one, so forth, until we get back to eight bells at four o'clock and repeat the process. And eight bells is magic for any sailor. That means it's time to change the watch. If you're working, you get off. If you're not, it's time to get to work. Uh, the bell could also be used to signal general alarm. But for more specific communication, on the right, we have a silver bosun pipe uh, with a silk ribbon attached to it. Incredible that that would survive 450 years on the bottom of the ocean. Um, but the bosun pipe survives today and may be in Coast Guard use uh, in the sea services. It's basically the sea service equivalent of the Army's bugle used to signal all kinds of things throughout the day. Well, how about the crew? Remember that there were perhaps 600 people who went down with the ship. Of those, in what was left of the ship, were found 179 sets of human remains. Several of these they could actually identify by their profession. On the right, we see a skeleton. And on the left of that, we see the forensic anthropologist's reconstruction of what this man may have looked like. And they can tell he was an archer. Probably a pretty easy guess because where he was found, he was clutching a longbow and a, a clutch of arrows. But also, just by examining his shoulder muscles, they can tell uh, that this man probably spent 20 years pulling a longbow. And that affected the size and shape of his clavicle, his scapula, his whole shoulder structure. A number of other individuals were identified by where they were found, the carpenter, carpenter shop, the cooks in the galley and so forth. And then there were other individuals who we didn't actually find their bodies, but we learned a lot about them, such as the ship's doctor by their possession. Here are some of the people who were identified tentatively as to their occupation and the forensic reconstructions of what they may have looked like. Who were they? What were their names? We don't really know. Uh, Except in the upper left, this is fascinating. This is a wooden bowl that was found in the galley along with the body of the cook, and it is inscribed Naiku, cook. That's as close as we can come to identifying any of the actual people who were aboard the ship at the time it died. Uh, but that's just an incredible human touch after 450 years. Uh, on the right top, the markings on the master gunner's chest. We don't know whether he could write or not. He could probably do some kind of writing. On the bottom left, on the bottom of the surgeon's flask or drinking mug, that's the surgeon's mark. And on the right, we have the markings on a pewter plate of the Viscount, who was the senior officer of the entire fleet. He was actually on board the Great Harry. The night before the battle, the captain of the Mary Rose went to a big dinner on board the Great Harry. And it's interesting to speculate how the Viscount's silverware ended up back on the Mary Rose, uh, whether somebody quietly purloined a dish, or whether uh, he had previously brought it there, or whether maybe in that night before the battle, the captain of the Mary Rose brought back some weapons. We'll never know. But in any case, we're able to attribute some of these objects to particular people. The remains of the crew, uh, a token member of the crew was in fact buried inside Westminster Cathedral on the floor near the entrance, uh, kind of the tomb of the unknown sailor. And what do we see from the remains of these people about their health? Well, on the left side, we see a number of bones that are displayed, uh, some leg bones that show signs of healed fractures, not necessarily very well healed, but healed. In the center, a pair of bones uh, that show that that sailor had had suffered from rickets in his childhood. It's basically a 
nutritional deficiency disease, lack of vitamin D that causes the bones in the leg to become soft and slow. On the right, a bone representing someone who had had scurvy. Scurvy would create blood clots along the bones, and those would sometimes calcify and create kind of bony lesions on the bone. On the middle left, a skull, which has very few teeth, and in fact, parts of the jawbone had eroded away. This guy needed a dentist badly. Uh, below him, a pair of elbow joints that show arthritis, hip trauma, and then the uh, skull that's on the bottom right, you see it enlarged on the bottom right of the screen, had an arrow hole in the head. This was not a hole from the battle of the day of the Mary Rose Bank. This is something this man has incurred sometime in his past and recovered from. Above that, we have a tooth, which if you've ever had a toothache, you can imagine what that one felt like. Uh, not quite. So what kind of health care do we have? Uh, top left, we see the surgeon's chest. It was recovered from the surgeon's cabin. It's got all kinds of items in it. Uh, contained all kinds of containers for medicine. That nasty looking syringe there was not used as we would think a syringe was used. That was used on a sailor who may have contacted an STD, and that would be used to insert, inject mercury into the ascending member to uh, scourge him of the disease. Lower right, a roll of linen bandages, uh, which were impregnated with salve of some sort, and some more of the surgeon's possessions on the bottom. Left, we see on the far right at that bottom left, a small iron pot with four handles. That was actually a mortar that was used to grind uh, medicines into the powder. Next to that, a pan that was used to heat things as necessary. And here we have a whole array of different things. Uh, in the center left, we see a shelf with three objects on it. Those are lancets that were used uh, if you had unbalanced body humors, too much of the wrong fluid, they would uh, use that to cut your skin. And in this case, they do bloodletting into the bowl that's immediately below them. Below that, there's something that looks a little like a drill. Uh, that's exactly what it was, used for trepanation. If you happen to have uh, migraines, or if you happen to suffer from fits, or if you showed some kind of insanity, the obvious solution was to drill a hole in your skull. Uh, to the right of that, we see a variety of things for cutting. Uh, to the far right bottom, there's a chisel, and above that, a saw. The chisel, along with that mallet, was very handy if you had to have a finger or a toe amputated. Uh, the saw would be used for larger amputation. And uh, in the top center, there's some long objects which were used as probes. If you had a wound, they could stick that in there, find the bullet or whatever it got into, and hopefully get it out with the tweezers that you see between the bowl and the mallet. And the mallet, by the way, not only was handy for amputation, it was also very good for dental work if you needed any teeth. Clothing, what did they wear? Well, not a lot of this survived, unfortunately, but on the left, we see one of several leather jerkins, basically vests or sleeveless jackets uh, that were recovered. On the top right, a pair of slippers. On the bottom, a watch of woolen fabric with a plaid pattern. In the center, a clasp for somebody's cloak. And on the bottom left, that star-shaped weird thing, imagine all those pieces being sewn together. That made a, basically a skull cap for the surgeon, which indicated that he was a gentleman who had completed a seven-year apprenticeship uh, and was a master surgeon. They also had footwear, lots and lots of shoes, and boots that would have been worn by the officers. Bottom right, we see a woolen sock. And on the left, a pair of slippers. What did they eat? Well, uh, we see under food, that's not actually recovered from the Mary Rose, that's a reproduction piece of hardtack that sailors have forever eaten, petrified bread when at sea. Uh, on the upper right, we have a bunch of sheep bones. There were about 30 sheep car carcasses recovered from the wreck. Uh, and on the bottom, uh, chunks of beef bones cut into portion size pieces. There were eight barrels recovered from the wreck, each containing about 250 portions of beef. And below that, dried fish. And to the right, some seeds, probably from plums or prunes. 
a variety of other things. So they actually had a surprisingly varied diet. And of course, drink. Uh, the main drink was beer, because who wanted to drink that raunchy water? Uh, it was fairly weak beer. Uh, but to drink it, of course, you have to cap, uh, cap the keg. Uh, first, you take the bung out of the bung hole. That's the cork that blocks it. And then we stick that kind of triangular shaped thing into the hole. That's a spile. It has a hole through the center. And we would stick that other object into it as shown in the bottom. That's called a shiv. We would put the spile in the bung hole. We would put the shiv in that. And that basically serves to block it. We simply pull out the shiv and the beer runs until we fill the cup. We need something to put it in. Pewter mugs, we have leather canteens of various varieties, uh, different kinds of flasks, uh, metal and ceramic. But the officers lived and ate quite well. A uh, huge variety of pewter ware from the officers found in the ship. And here, quick comparison side by side. The officers and the enlisted people were eating pretty much the same stuff, not necessarily prepared to the same standard. So they need the same equipment, but the quality of the equipment was. Here we have the uh, galley, the cook stove. On the far upper left, you see a huge copper cauldron uh, that was sufficient to prepare a bowl of soup for about 400 people at a time. The uh, bellows that he used to fan the fire, his butter churn on top, and a iron cauldron on the bottom for additional cooking. An assortment of containers of all kinds of materials found throughout the ship. Personal items. Upper left, we have a bunch of combs. These are not ordinary combs. One side of most of these is large for combing your hair, but the other side of this is a knit comb. Obviously, apparently, pretty much everybody on board was infested with lice. On the right on the top, that very ornate object is an earwax scoop. On the bottom left, someone's shaving kit. You see the razor in the front, number three. Number five is a shaving mirror. And to the right of that, just above the number seven, is kind of a Swiss Army knife manicure. And of course, I said rosary beads, which leads us to the jewelry. Uh, the top left, a religious medallion, a couple of silver rings. In the center, a mourning ring. If you were rich, you would leave money to your friends, and they would have rings made to remember you by. A, um, what do we call that? Seal. Uh, for impressing your personal seal into the wax and communication. On the bottom, a pomander. This would have held very expensive herbs and worn on the body. It was kind of a personal deodorizer, a religious medal, and on the bottom right, a half of a pair of tigers. Luxury items, top left, we have a pocket um, sundial. First on the top right of gold coins in the center of very ornate bone carving. On the bottom left, a pepper mill. If you had pepper in those days, pepper was like gold. Uh, and if you were able to carry some around and have your own personal pepper mill, you were sundial. On the bottom right, another pomander, which when opened up revealed a personal sundial. These were things that the ordinary sailors would not have had. Books, a surprising number found on board. The book covers were remarkably well preserved. The pages were long gone. But in one case, on the bottom right, you can see where the words from the page were in fact impressed on the inside of the cover. Most of these were religious texts. Amusement? Well, we got games. We have backgammon and dice. And on the top right, we have the top of a barrel inscribed. A little hard to see, but the lines on the left half of the barrel are the playing fields for a game called Nine Man's Morris, popular among sailors for several centuries. We see a fiddle, a flute, and a drum. Well, among all the crew members, everybody's favorite has to be Hatch. We see Hatch on the left. Hatch was a terrier, uh, about a year and a half old, about a foot and a half tall. And uh, if you went to the museum and you fell in love with Hatch, on the right, you can go to the gift shop and you can buy Hatch. Oh, and right below the bottom Hatch's nose, yeah, we also have a representation of some of the stoves. The detail of work that was done on the excavation, they were able to recover the tiny bones from rats. Uh, and on the left, just in case you thought the lice weren't enough of a problem, that's a human flea. So these guys not only were infested with lice, they were infested with
And finally, we have the bow emblem. You remember on the Mary Rose, it had the uh, Tudor Rose on the bow. This is the figurehead from the Mary Rose on the top left, and reconstruction of it on the bottom left. And all in all, what this ship gives us is a priceless window into kind of the life of ordinary people. Although, granted, they were soldiers and sailors, they were not the nobles and the rich people, uh, which pretty much is the rest of Tudor life which was preserved elsewhere in England. But the Mary Rose gives us a huge examination of the other side of life. And the museum is an incredible place where people can come and see and learn. Uh, it's actually part of the greater museum, the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, where it's mind boggling what there is to see there. I went for a day and discovered that I was about four days short of what I needed. We see HMS Victory, uh, Admiral Nelson's flagship from the Napoleonic Wars. On the top right, HMS Warrior, which was the second seagoing ironclad ship in the world. Below that, a World War I patrol boat. And on the bottom left, a museum about Admiral Nelson, and that's his funeral barge. So, all in all, that has to be probably the second best maritime museum in the entire world. Uh, I speak to you today from the Mariners Museum in Newport News, and that's what I have for you about the Mary Rose. So, no questions? We can take those now. Hi, Dan. Um, yeah, we got a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, w a couple of questions that came in were uh, how deep was this ship uh, in, when it sunk? Like, what, what was the depth of the water? It was not deep at all. It was, I would. I should know this, but of course the depth that it, the wreck was found is not necessarily the same as the depth in which it sank, but roughly 30 feet. When it sank, the masts and sails were still mostly above the water. Um, so it was easy diving uh, depth, but enough to drown everybody who went down with the ship. Okay. Um, another one here uh, was for you. It said, thank you for the presentation. Uh, are you familiar with the term Navy pitch? If so, do you have any uh, reference to the term uh, Navy, or any written sources on it? Navy pitch? Yeah. Um, not without a little more guidance. Okay. That could um, be fair, you know, historically pitch, uh, fine pitch or tar were used in caulking, but beyond that, no idea. Okay. Um, and that person gave us their email address and we can, um, Okay. We can follow up with them with some more more information. Um, let's see here. Another one. Um, let's see here. Uh, so the preservation of the ship and artifacts appears to be remarkable. Is that attributed to the burial um, in the bottom of the Solent? Oh, absolutely. Um, anything that was not buried and sealed from exposure to the water, basically by being quickly filled with spilt, it um, created a fairly anaerobic atmosphere in which you know, things uh, that were not subject to easy decay lasted much longer. So we see a lot of leather artifacts, for example. Uh, the uh, thing that was most affected was iron, because even though it was covered with sand, it was wet, and so large portions of iron artifacts uh, we don't have. But Yes, the preservation was due, I would say, entirely due to the Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, we have a raised hand. Before we get to that, we have one more quick question, it looks like. Uh, how long did it take to build the ship? Um, it was commissioned in 1510 and launched in 1511. So something, give or take, a year. Uh, that's pretty quick compared to ships these days. Yes, it was. And it was um, in those days when you consider that everything was done by hand. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we have one uh, one person raising their hand. So uh, Gabriel, go ahead and please unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wood. It's fascinating. Now I've got to go to Portsmouth <laughs> and see that. It was that on my bucket list, and I'll tell you what. Don't try to do it in a day. Right. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, I'm the guy that asked about the Navy pitch. I'm going to go somewhere else because it's they've uh, I'm already being helped on that topic. But is uh, was that a urethral syringe that was used for mercury? Yes, it was. Okay, that's what I thought. That's uh, 
uh, bone chilling. Um, um, yes. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, but it probably worked if you didn't die, right? Well, I, I don't know that it worked, but it didn't kill enough people for them to think they should stop it. Um, in those days, mercury was used as a medication for a lot of things, and people probably recovered in spite of it, just like people recovered from bloodletting in spite of it. Okay. Uh, well, I, le I left you my email because I asked about, uh, I'm interested in anything related to uh, uh, caulking, chinking, uh, painting. Uh, I did want to ask, uh, like below, uh, I'm interested in pitch, obviously, but below, uh, boats are always of that era, galleons and stuff like that. They're always uh, depicted as being brown. The first um, il illustration that you showed of the Mary Rose, it showed that below the waterline it was black, and that's what that fits with a lot of whatever the research that I've done that. The part that actually made contact with water, uh, they had to cut, uh, cover it with navy pitch, and it tended to be black. Could you comment on that? Um, you have said about as much as I know about it. Uh, it tended to waterproof the hull, and in some cases, it was probably also a deterrent to marine worms boring in the hull. But beyond that, I'm not an expert in that area at all. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, uh, do you know anything else about the morning rings? That's so, uh, it's so interesting. Um, no, it was a common practice from apparently the Middle Ages up through Elizabethan times. Uh, or, um, yeah, um, no. <laughs> thank you very much, both of you. My pleasure. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we're, we're running a bit long, um, but uh, we just have uh, one more question here. Um, uh, it's a person named Michael. Uh, he's asking if you got his email on who the captain of the Mary Rose was when it sunk. Uh, I have that information. It's not in my head right now, and I can send that to you if we have your email. Okay, great. All right, so uh, that we're we're a bit long, so that's about all the time we have. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Everybody, have a good day. You do the same. All right, and uh, on behalf of everybody else here at the Mayor's Museum, we just wanted to thank you all for coming and joining us, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>